<clears throat> hey, what's up, you guys? How's it going? Uh, we're about to just do another quick stream here. Uh, just popping in, just kind of seeing how you guys are, and uh, to be able to just skip, sit and sketch, sketch for a little bit and uh, see how things can go out. Um, as I finish this one, I'm going to actually put a little bit of a variance in terms of color application, which is going to be more marker this time around. Uh, before last time, we, we did a watercolor piece uh, on the ink sketch there, how you, how you kind of finished up. But with this one, we're going to sketch it as I already kind of just started a little bit. And as I was beginning sketching on my table, I was like, again, my little stream is. So uh, here we are, and uh, we'll get started. And again, like I said, probably going to be about an hour, um, hour and a half at the most. And then uh, we'll see how, if we can, how much of this we can get done. Of course, as people pop in, anytime you guys have questions and stuff like that, please let me know. Uh, I'm just going to adjust the camera a little bit here. We're just going to zoom a slight bit more. Right about there. Um, what we're going to be sketching right now is something related to the whole fantasy side of things. Uh, I've been kind of sketching out this kind of orc-like character because I've been watching all this fantasy stuff on streaming uh, recently. And um, on social media just the other day, I posted up a piece that did have uh, an elven character slashing off the head of an orc. So this time I wanted to actually draw uh, and make one up of an orc. Whether that or a goblin or whatever the kind of like creature s humanoid kind of character would be. Um, so we'll see how far we get. How's it going, Carson? Welcome. And uh, actually, you know what? I'll also introduce you that actual image as well. Not a little bit. You can see the actual piece. Excuse me for one second. I'm just going to readjust some of the screens. So there's the, the piece that I was working on earlier. Uh, this is the one with the elven piece with the head being lopped off right there. This is all ballpoint. Uh, this particular sketchbook is made by a company called uh, Epica, and they're based in Italy. They make this really nice leather-bound book, case-bound. And they make their own paper in-house. It's kind of like this a uh, little bit of a toothier, rougher paper. It's got a good amount of page kind of on here. They're not cheap to get. So here's a little bit of a quick sketchbook tour before we get actually get started on the um, this here. Testing out the watercolor in this one. It buckles a bit with some water mediums. Uh, this is that predator piece I've done, some animals. Paper is a little bit hard to turn the page on because it's got so much rough edges that it kind of like sticks together. Uh, another ballpoint piece with the lions. Um, I started doing some people on horses. This was a marker piece I had done. And I'm planning to use a marker a little bit today, so it does bleed through quite a bit. But if I have a protective sheet, it should be okay. Cars and vehicles. This is a logo piece I was working on. Uh, studies, posing, Batman stuff. Or Batman stuff. Elven character. So there isn't that much work done yet, uh, just yet on the sketchbook. Relatively uh, a newer one that I started up, but I'm in a couple pages now. So uh, we're going to be doing some kind of a orc creature s type of thing. I'm going to give him. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm switch. What I'm using for the pen right now. This is the uh, Tombow. Uh, you guys are pretty familiar with Tombows, I'm sure. Look like. Yes, I thought I had one. You weren't sitting over here, but Tombow pens are those really longer ones that had the brush tip and a chisel tip. And so it's the same company, Tombow, uh, but this is a Fure Nosuke uh, type of pen, which is more for like calligraphy work. And it's quite thin. It's a felt tip brush. So it is a bit spongy and flexible. And um, I like it for the strokes it puts down. And the two types I have here, they come in a packet. You can buy them in a pair like this one. This one right here is slightly thicker with a softer tip. This one is slightly thinner with a hard tip. So this one's really good to establish some nice line variation, thick and thin strokes. And again, like I said, it really is good for calligraphy work. Um, if anybody is you know, doing that kind of stuff, obviously you probably might be familiar with this kind of pen. If today, okay. I've only came to an awareness of these kind of pens uh, probably you know, in the last, I would say, decade or so. But during the time when I was in school, College, I wasn't really aware of these kind of uh, tool sets, and I'm pretty sure they were around. It's just that I never really used them. Uh, we'll see how many we get in today, but uh, you guys are welcome again to ask questions and chat. 
talk about certain things. Today, I can, you know, maybe we can focus the conversation a little bit based on first our conversations, uh, depending on if people ask questions or whatnot. But um, there are a couple of things popping up soon in terms of events, things that are, you know, happening. Uh, things like the Comic Con in San Diego, and, not San Diego, I'm sorry, New York. San Diego was already nine months ago. Uh, New York Comic Con is coming up real soon. And then, of course, after New York Comic Con, I'll be visiting out into the Lightbox Expo, which is happening here in Pasadena. So it's really close to where I live, actually. So we'll be going there next. I'll be going there next. And that should be a pretty crazy show. So I figure I can discuss that a little bit because we're getting closer and closer. We're less than about uh, two and a half weeks, maybe away, uh, until the show actually begins. I, myself, schedule-wise, will have quite a few things to deal with. Uh, so if anybody if anybody does plan to go to the show, which is October uh, 13, 14, something like that, um, I'll be there doing a, a talk, solo talk. I'll be doing some portfolio review stuff. Uh, I will be doing a conversational uh, kind of presentation with Marshall Vanger. I'll be doing some stuff for Proco as well, too. I'm sure a lot of you guys who are watching this or finding me have come through the Proco channel, um, watching the YouTube and stuff like that on there the videos that I've done. So we will plan to probably do another one when we get to the show. But um, it should be fun. So if anybody does plan to go, definitely stop by. I'll be sitting with the Superani crew. You know, uh, Kim Jong-gi will be there. Uh, Dong Ho Kim. Uh, Charles Liu, who's an instructor from Kazone. And Eliza Ivanova will be with us as well, too. So it should be a pretty fun time. We're going to be set within the main hall, I believe, in the aisleway with a series of tables. And I'm a little bit concerned because... You know, obviously, everyone's going to go there to go see Kim Jong-gi, and uh, they're going to stand in line to get his book. But um, depending on where we're situated, I feel like it's going to be really narrow there. So I don't know if it's smart to place him and also us as a group together in that little spot in the corner of the back of the, uh, the hallway. Um, not little, but it's definitely in the back corner somewhere. Hopefully, it's not too bad. Question from Carson is, have you uh, looked at or followed any Bridgman and Anatomy books? Yes. I've, I've looked at anatomy books from Bridgman. I wouldn't really even consider them anatomy books. Uh, they're more based on uh, figurative styling, right? In terms of how he's able to convey and sketch out uh, gesture, pose, the, you know, he uses a lot of the contrapposto, um, how he's able to capture certain indications of groupings. I wouldn't call it an anatomical book because it's not really about breaking down muscles and bones and stuff like that at, on a medical sense in a way. Um, it does have anatomy involved in it because he does study a lot of that kind of stuff. But in those particular books, the small ones that he's put out or the ones that are out there uh, are more collections and drawings of things that he put together. Um, but anyways, you know, they're, they're great books and, and I, I would recommend them because he does have a very sculptural look to his stuff. And, uh, you know, doing copies of his work is a great way to kind of learn about rhythms and movements and shapes and forms about how, uh, you know, some of those kind of human figures of gestures can be captured in the way he does it. And then, of course, diversifying with other artists that you're looking at, I think, could be also good to do, too. You know, whether it's uh, going to be, like, Honest Even Loomis to Bert Hogarth uh, to uh, Glenn Vilpu. You know, many different other techniques from things like the Rally Technique and whatnot. So there's many things out there you can be looking at to kind of harness as many variables of methods of approach as you can. So. Have I used it myself personally? I mean, I've studied Richmond stuff directly as a student. You know, I was a copy of his drawings when I was young. and I, I had a little bit of influence of his work into my pieces back then. Not as so much a, a, anymore. Uh, I like his stuff, but I do find his work to be a little bit too... I kind of want to use the word granular, a little bit gritty. Uh, again, it has a very sculptural look to it, as if the characters are built out of stone. Uh, or not characters, more like figures. And it's, it's great, and I do like it, but I just feel like it's a bit too heavy of a, of a read situation. So I use elements and pieces, especially with the way he does capture gesture, but I love the way he plays with straight and curves a lot of times. So um, his stuff is great, but like I said, not as influential as it was back then. When I, to me, in terms of his figurative stuff, who I still look at, I still look, you know, honestly, guys like Loomis, I still enjoy. There can be people that are siding camps. Some people like them, some people don't. But I like Loomis' stuff mainly because of his incorporation of perspective and primitive forms. I, again, his books that are out there, some of them, they're not necessarily anatomically based. They're more based on the idea of breaking down shape and form language uh, with a good sense of proportion and uh, making sure things of constructive elements of whether his eight ha head count system or otherwise are, are explored. Uh, but I also just like his aesthetic. I kind of like the classical kind of 50s styling illustrations. You know, he does a lot of stuff from portraiture to almost advertising styling of, of pieces with its figures. So they have a very classical look, but I'm a fan of that. So 
some people like more traditional atelier styling of figurative stuff. For me, I like more designed illustration type things. So, commercial work. I hope that answers your question to a degree. And of course, the best thing to do for anybody who's interested in stuff like anatomy or figurative books is to explore them on your own and, and copy them, obviously. Uh, again, we're going to have an orc standing here. I'm going to maybe um, have, it's going to be at a slight up angle like this. As it comes down, I'm going to have the eye level at about maybe chest. As it goes from eye level down, it'll then start to shift the perspective downwards a little bit. And he's going to have some kind of like, you know, creature-esque dog-like thing sitting next to him, which will have his like hand on top of his head. Uh, I'm just thinking of this now. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but I'm just imagining what this could be while I'm sketching this stuff out. Being an orc or some kind of creature-esque humanoid, and imagine some of the armor set that he's wearing. I'd imagine he's going to be wearing pelts, a lot of bone structure. You'll see a lot of the orcs from you know the Lord of the Rings and stuff like that where they designed them. They're much more uh, nature-infused but twisted in many ways because, of course, the orcs used to derive from elves back in the day of the myth and the lore of Tolkien stuff. It's by Morgoth, right? Here we have some pelt on the side of the shoulder coming down. Uh, again, I think his right arm, I think, is going to be coming downwards. But I'm going to have him go back and then down into him holding like a, a dagger in the sheath. Some kind of bladed weapon. Possibly his arm on top of maybe a head of an axe. Just imagining it right now. Anyway, which I do have an axe right here. I'm imagine like where he could place his hand. I think that's going to be head, putting his hand on the head of the axe, and a large kind of stick coming down the bottom of the side of it there. Um, take a look. How's it going, Mike? I'm going to have more of the armor coming down the side. Angular, sharp, twisted metals, attachments of bone, maybe. Almost maybe a little bit indistinguishable between each other. Imagine things that are being like tied or faceted, knotted together as well too, with twine or rope. A piece off of it. As I said, I'm going to make this portion right up here about eye level. So as it shifts downward this direction, I'm going to shift, shift his torso and hips down in perspective a little bit. Uh, yeah, Mike, it's been a little bit in terms of the last time I was actually a part of some of the streams. We were here uh, just last week uh, doing one. I was supposed to plan to do another one this coming Tuesday. But this weekend, as I was sitting and sketching a little bit, I thought I would just share it while we're doing it. These kind of pop-up streams, I'm kind of no, I'm now more like on that side of doing it this way. Uh, I think schedule like planned, you know, stream sessions. I I tried to do, and I can retain it for a little bit, but you know, schedule gets kind of crazy. It's hard to kind of do it in regular kind of methods. But I think I'm more suited for this like in the moment when I'm sketching, drawing. I just kind of pop on. So I'm glad you guys were able to catch me. I think this is one of those situations where people just are going to have that right moment in time to catch my streams and they can jump in and, and kind of interact a little bit. Others will probably miss it. But I kind of like that, that spontaneity maybe a little bit here where people have a chance to be able to catch it or not. Best thing to do, of course, you just keep, keep an eye on the Instagram. You know, I usually post a story of it 10 minutes before I go on. There's a multi-layer of armor with like spikes and stuff hanging off of the side. Um, let's see. You know, pieces coming up like this. A bit more dangerous for his face, but being in a work, I don't think he really cares.
push his shoulder deltoid back this direction. Or muscle will come down this direction here with a bunch of straps. Maybe some additional pieces of scrap armor together. Carson <clears throat> saying, I know I want to make a career with your art, but not sure what. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, uh, how can I see what options are available? Um, basically being, you know, a part of, the, I guess, the, the traffic of information, right, that goes into sharing a lot of the stuff that you might be considering to do. Uh, that could be things like, of course, social media, right? So as you're part of social media, you can kind of follow other artists that parallel the things that you're interested in. And as you see how they are approaching things, obviously you don't have to do it the way they are, nor exactly to the level of quality, but it gives you an instance of following a goal set towards how you can maybe go about doing it. Um, so then you start to create a few things that might align with that. Not to say you have to obviously you know, do it the way they're doing it stylistically or the kind of work they do. Obviously you want to generate your own stuff. Uh, but in terms of how they package it, how they share it, you know, those kind of things, inspirational towards moving your own direction. Um, and you learn it obviously by trial and error. You keep doing it the more you do. And you know, in terms of, you know what you're going to be doing with your art only you can find that out i can't tell you you know i don't can't read your mind in terms of what you like and don't like you know i can tell you what i like but obviously if i say hey i like to make things like books and you're like well i'm not interested in making books. there it's like to help you so um the best thing to do of course is to go about your own and, and discover those things by attempting and experimenting with things but by researching and finding out other artists that are out there that you do appreciate uh, you can then find a way to find some interest or inspiration from there that you can grab to be able to produce things of your own that can, you know, obviously be faithful to your directions in art and what you want to produce, but also something that you can maybe try to produce in the down lines as you get more comfortable doing so, right? And also as your quality and your skills go up, uh, you continue to share and, and grow and mature as an artist. Uh, but it's if it's about things like, I don't know, um, working in the industry and stuff like this, and obviously attending schools and classes and building your fundamental skill sets uh, are going to be important because you need them. Uh, to eventually then build a portfolio, you can start to apply for work. And as long as you're competitive and you're driven enough, uh, you might get a chance to do so. No guarantee, but the way it works for everybody, right? Uh, Mike is asking, do, do you tend to draw from visualizing in your mind or do you fall back on experience? Uh, not sure what makes sense. I tend to do the latter. It's hard for me to imagine in my head, uh, tend to fuss things over out, out on paper. So both. Um, I, I visualize in my mind from things that are based on things that I've seen. Right. So if you're saying, you know, if it's do you fall, fall back on experience? Well, experience is based on then what you've accrued and, and uh, harnessed or absorbed over the many years of what you've been doing uh, creatively or otherwise. So for me, from all the creative drawing and also the observations of real things in the world are the elements of the rule, uh, not rules, but more just the elements of inspiration and visual kind of guidelines uh, that I can then incorporate hybrid mix together to kind of create this amalgamation of something that is my own. Uh, but it's still derived from the real world. and um, I can twist it, you know, push it, play with it proportionally, story-wise, functionally, and uh, I have complete control of it actually doing my own. But it is, it is both, if anything else, right? Uh, it's not one or the other. And do I have a direct picture as to what I'm doing? No, it's, it's one of those things where I'm also discovering it as I'm doing on the page. So with this one over here, as I'm drawing it, I make up new ideas and more concepts, but also change things on the fly. But this is also coming from the experience of doing it for thousands of hours, you know, to the point where I don't need to sit and think so much about like, oh, I have to know exactly where this thing has to go. I can make the adjustments and adapt immediately while I'm talking to you, while I'm sketching live in front of people. Armor pieces here. thinking about scaled kind of like armor crudely built shards sharp angles a bunch of like strap work and fabric material you know underneath not about chain mail that kind of stuff but we'll just keep it like material fabric really crude really rough maybe even more like pelt <clears throat> I'm seeing if there are any other questions. 
Akitun's asking, we've been really obsessed with Heinrich work, uh, Heinrich's work lately. It's truly amazing. Yeah, I agree. I think his work is awesome. Heinrich Clay, who Nakatunes is talking about. Uh, if anybody is planning to go to the Livebox Expo, I will be doing a conversational talk with Marshall Vendra for about an hour on Friday, I believe, at like 2 p.m. or something like this. And we'll be sitting down on a stage and uh, in front of a crowd, uh, basically talking about artists of inspirations, guys like Heinrich Clay. He'll be one of our main subjects. And we talk about a list of individuals that we look at uh, of inspiration and we talk about how we pull from them uh, visually but also probably even mentally uh, stylistically functionally whatever means that we can use to help us uh, problem solve and produce the things that we like to produce artistically so last chrono is asking you've been told different things but how would you define an intermediate level artist uh, intermediate level you're saying when it comes to in context to educationally or in terms of professionally because it can be seen in two camps because if you're talking about educationally obviously we have to understand the context of what begins and what ends right so an education educational level we have someone who's an entry student learning the basis of foundations the other end of that spectrum which is someone who's more advanced highly uh, trained student who's producing the portfolio to apply for a job so then what falls in between that right someone who does understand the basic fundamentals of things but being able to incorporate and adapt those fundamental skills and apply them into the entry ways of learning design is where I would say it kind of falls into. In professional side of things, now I would say who someone, ha I would, it, I would, if I gave you a certain time period, probably five years, five years. The first year is going to be the first two years, a lot of entry level understanding and learning and things. When you reach that 10 year period, you're kind of getting to the side of really understanding the, the pipeline process and methods of the industry, maybe experiencing multiple different fields. But about the five year period, I would say is a good amount enough time to have really built in a system of understanding of how to actually do the job you gotta do. Uh, so if I gave you a timeline, I would say a five year period is someone who may have learned enough information within the industry, not just fundamentally, but also applying it to the corporate field, to the studio level, to even like working freelance, working on your own projects, books or designs or whatever you're, you're producing. Uh, I think that five to 10 year period is that intermediate level going into maybe that transition of being able to run projects or manage projects. Uh, so, you know, once you pass 10 years, 15, 20 is where you're starting to become, you know, uh, that senior level in most like cases, right? So for myself, I'm working in the field for 15 years. Um, I, I came out of school in 2005, four, and I started working in 05. How's it going? Death sushi. Right now we're just all hanging out, drawing a, an orc-like character. So if you're sketching and drawing, also too, uh, if you want to follow along, here's a theme. Uh, basically, a, a orc. I'm going to try to pace myself and not rush through this one. Because I tend to do that when I'm live streaming, I'm talking so much, I move, move, move. I also want to put a little bit of thought in some of the line work here. Some of the positive and negative elements, details. I'm going to wrap it with some wine and other things, accents and accessories, sharp kind of claws and stuff like that. Finding his upper arm, and that's going to come down where he's going to be gripping some sort of dagger. Getting some perfect scars and stuff like that. Too. we're doing it leaving some areas open i want some breathing room even though i hear some of the armor set i want to kind of put a little bit of roughing on the edges but a lot of it i want to keep it kind of open the idea is to be able to catch how much you want to put in and how much you don't want to put in i would say in terms of the idea of attaining a certain level of experience that is on the level that is uh, what we talk talk about senior level right highly experienced is having that notion or understanding about what it is you draw and what it is you don't draw. And I'm still trying to reach that and to over detail things a lot of times. So learning how to stop, but learning how to read that and being sensitive on what is enough. And that's an aspect of design, it's an aspect of instinct, an aspect of being able to feel through the piece. I would say a lot of artists that I look at who I really enjoy their work, 
they're able to do so much with the piece with very little. Uh, Nakitun is asking, I know you're not big on mentoring people just out of the blue, but would you ever consider maybe if you, if the money was good and the person was truly committed, learning these principles from you directly? Well, I do offer that. Uh, I do offer a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program. And then under my own program, I don't do it through the schools. Uh, the only thing I do offer under a program that's mentorship labeled is under CGMA. So the online school, CG Master Academy, I do still offer a sketching mentorship, which is, a, you know, between five to 10 people of a group. Uh, but I don't, it's not really, I mean, it's one-on-one, -on -one, you get time, obviously, but it's not singular to just one person and me. It's a group of people that are there. So I still have to be considerate to the individuals, uh, but then also be considerate to the group um, because it's just, you know, a three-hour session meeting per week, it's about eight weeks long. Um, but my own program that I offer under my own school, I do offer the one-on-one -on -one mentorships. I only take on one person. And I take about maybe two individuals per session at the most. Um, but I have to interview you. I have to make sure I speak to you to make sure that what you're intending, what you want, and how I can help aligns with what I want to do. So if I feel like in terms of where you currently stand, uh, the kind of work you want to do, if it doesn't actually associate well to what I want to go or what I'm actually maybe uh, comfortable with or known for, then I would say, oh, I can give you recommendations of someone else you can look at, uh, but I'm not going to just take anybody. And those usually go for about eight weeks, and we meet once a week for about two hours. And I've been running that now for this last, you know, years, so. Question here from Salty Boy. Uh, you probably get this question a lot, but is there a timeline for the next installments of the Dynamic Bible on Superani? You got the first one, and uh, I'm glad you enjoy it. Thank you for the feedback, by the way. Uh, the second book timeline, what I can tell you right now is that it is not official, but what I'm intending is to be released by next year. Okay, when? Maybe by summertime, I would say. Uh, it'd be nice if I had it for uh, summertime in, in Comic-Con for next year. So that means I have to get that book started this year, which I would like to get it started as soon as all the shows wrap up. Uh, once the live box ends in October, I think that month of October, I'm going to start to go into it and try to produce and finish it by the end of the year. Uh, so if I can get it done early by maybe next January, February, I can get it input to design and also printing. It might need to be earlier than that, possibly. Uh, there won't be any official announcement until later in the next year, I would say, but but I can tell you based on my own you know, current flow of things that I'm going to try to get that done this year, this year that is, which it is the intention. Um, the next book itself will be a little bit more ages. I'm trying to shoot for more than 100, 120, um, because instead of just two subjects, I'm going for three instead. Uh, so the first book, I might actually leave that having all the exercises that we had done and leaving it that as it is. Next book might be just three different subject matters that are covered. Um, will I go into more exercises? I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, maybe kind of touch upon them again or integrate them into the, uh, the lessons of the topics. But we'll see. But in the ideal situation, it would be nice to have it by Comic-Con next year, July. Okay, so right now his mid-chest torso coming down this direction. Uh, let's actually do his forearm and the weapon. Coming down over here, then his hips. I'm gonna wrap around cross contour underneath this direction, and his leg gonna go down down to the bottom, which will taper downwards at a downward perspective. So the eye level, like I said in the beginning, was gonna be somewhere near the chest. Start to push in on the forearm. Let me zoom out a little bit. That'd be great, Jeff. Yeah, if you do see me there, uh, if you find me at the table, or otherwise, you're welcome to say hi. You know, these kind of live streams, you can only watch somebody draw for so long. I hope that you guys are also trying to sketch and draw. Why are you here? Using it in a moment towards being able to practice and discuss and whatnot. But again, you can only observe somebody just sketching and sitting there for... <laughs> A certain period of time before it gets a bit boring. Hey Joe, how's it going? Uh, you've been really seeing progress lately, and it's been. It feels like you got uh, some Miyagi working the fundamentals uh, with me, and so yeah, I'm glad to see it's paying off. We're hearing that it's paying off. 
Joe here has been taking classes with me in multiple situations under my own programs. So I'm glad to see or hear that you are pushing and I hope that you're using the Discord uh, to your advantage still. Being involved in that, talking with others. People that are here live now, we got about 70 viewers right now. Again, not, not gigantic, but enough to get, you know, varying people that may not know about certain experiences of classes and how I run things. But there is a Discord that I offer within my own school, uh, which is a perpetually growing kind of community. So uh, if anybody's interested in, in hearing about the classes that I offer in the future, uh, ask now, you can. With you. I'm not going to try to promote the school right now. I will say one thing is that next session, which is going to begin sometime in November, I, I plan to offer a in-house experience if I can. It's going to be in Pasadena, uh, not at a school. It's going to be at the art store uh, that I go to, a local one called the Blue Rooster Art Store in Pasadena. And they have a room there which they're going to uh, allow me to use. And so I'll be using their space and uh, I'll be teaching classes in person. It'll be a, a quick, short boot camp version I'm going to offer first just to test it out. And that'll be most likely next um, in person thing. Let's go back into the top of his head. I want that hair to be drawn out. There's some kind of knot, bones, and stuff in his hair. Thought about, I wanted to use some watercolor on this one, but. Sometimes when I do the line drawing, I kind of like it just black and white. <laughs> kind of like it just line work. Um, I'm a little bit apprehensive now. It's like, hmm, I really wanted to use some water or uh, markers on this one. Maybe I'll do it for a different piece instead. Because I like where this one is at the moment. I'm also not 100% uh, confident in this tool, this pen, uh, with markers. I'm afraid it might bleed, smudge. This is a pigment-based ink but I'm not 100% confident that it's going to stay permanent. I don't think I'm going to risk it. Yeah. Watercolor this one, or not watercolor, marker with this one. I don't know, maybe I'll test it and just kind of see. Sometimes the best thing to do is just try it and find out. And if it messes it up, that's okay. <clears throat> Question here is, do I plan on releasing video tutorials on my uh, YouTube channel in time in the future, or at least another one recently. Uh, that was just a couple days ago. Um, this feed right here is obviously left to subscription, but after about maybe this couple days, uh, I will be posting it up on YouTube as well too. So this content is for early access for subscribers initially, and I might keep it up there for about a week onto my uh, Twitch channel, and after a week, I'll probably post it on YouTube. But I have to record more content like this. If I don't have it. I can share stuff from my classes, but um, I made a, a slight adjustment to my classes right now where the stream is a lot smoother. When I posted up that Batman one just recently, I just noticed how choppy it was and I didn't like it. Um, I didn't actually ever really consider what the opposite end of what it looked like for those students. And I, I didn't know, but I completely forgot. So recently when I downloaded it, I kind of needed to solve it. So I did, and, I, and the stream is not much smooth, smoother. So once I start getting more demos in classes, I might post those more in the future. Uh, do I like anime or um, you don't draw anything related to it? I love anime. I grew up on mangas and animes. I am a child of the 80s. I was born in 81. So in the 90s, and of course, you know, I, I first really interacted a lot with Western comics and, and cartoon series. I grew up in the U.S. So for me, a lot of the stuff in the 80s, early, mid 80s was, you know, the Thundercat stuff, her, um, he man and that, you know, those famous properties, Silverhawks and that kind of thing. But uh, as I got into my teenage years, you know, Marvel Comics and DC Comics were still a really big thing, which I really loved at the time I was a kid. But I wasn't really introduced to things of anime or mangas and, and Asian comics and cartoons until uh, probably my, you know, early teens around that time, um, late youth. And for me, Dragon Ball was a big thing. Because at the time when I was looking at Dragon Ball, from the comics into the cartoons, it was being made. And not the cartoon, but more like the movies. Because in the U.S., they didn't exist when I was looking at them. This is like late 80s, early 90s, you know, when he was making them. So I grew up on the very first Dragon Balls when he was just a kid. And so Toriyama was actually making the comics, releasing them. And I would be able to get translated versions in Korean. Because 
uh, I had access to them uh, through my parents. Uh, they, they had a shop they knew of next door and where they worked, uh, where they uh, had copies. So um, as I grew up with that, by the time Dragon Ball came to the U.S. through things like, uh, what is that, Tommy and stuff like this, I was not going to high school. And I had no interest in it. Uh, I liked the, the mangas and co comics. And I read those all the time, but I couldn't stand the cartoon. So I didn't watch those. And for me, Dragon Ball ended after the last book, issue 42. After that, when they started bringing back things, I really wasn't interested at that point. So I kept watching other things, and I was, I was still really into animes and mangas. Today, I, I'm not, like, fervent for it. I'm not feverish looking for the kind of stuff. But if it's interesting, I'll check it out. Even recently, the whole Cyberpunk, you know, um, the Twinners thing series on Netflix was actually pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, Trigger, the studio makes really cool stuff. And I've always been a fan of their work. I was a little bit apprehensive with them collaborating with Cyberpunk, which I really like the game, by the way, too. But usually collaborative stuff like this doesn't always really work very well. But I thought they actually really kicked it out of the park with this one. It was great. <clears throat> uh, what books would you recommend for art guys? Uh, I mean, there's so many, right? That's a big question. It's kind of like asking what's your favorite movie. Uh, if I could say if there's like one book to even kind of consider. For me growing up, it, it actually kind of was, um, it, it sounds childish and maybe something like, well, I'm not really interested in a book like that. But for me, when I was growing up, it was uh, How to Draw the Marvel Way. And a lot of artists who grew, grew up at the time in the 90s uh, will probably tell you they looked at that book. And I know that you, you might say, that, well, I'm not really interested in comic books, comic art. But it's like, it's not really about doing comic art. It's looking at just visual inspiration. And also just techniques and methods of how to you know, approach things. Uh, and I found that book as, as primitive as it may seem. And being the fact that it's you know, a tied property to Marvel, uh, I learned actually quite a bit from it. And it actually was a big staple and an in, uh, impressionable moment in my life uh, with the interaction that I had with Marvel and the, and the book at the time when I was a child. So of course, you know, it's still around today and it's not maybe the best recommendation. Uh, there are other books that are out there, of course, that are very, very uh, amazing. You know, in terms of an actual art book itself, I've always been a fan of the concept art books from Weta, so things like District 9. I think it's one of the best art books that are out there, honestly. Uh, are, am I going to sell any books of my sketches? Something like how I how a Junkie does uh, would be really nice to acquire. Well, I, I, I did a personal sketchbook and I released it self-published years ago. This was a 2015 year. And, it, and since then, all the books I've ever released have always either been educational or like comic kind of stuff now. So I haven't released an actual collection of artwork since 2015. And I am seriously thinking about it. There's no direct plans right now in terms of when I would release something like this because you know, there's so many other books I've planned out. Um, but would I like to at some point soon? Sure, absolutely. But we'll see. Will I do it with Superani? I have no idea. It's all based on how much interest they have in publishing it um, with me. Uh, they, they request, you know, obviously I'm working with them for the, the Dynamite Bible. But in terms of other books, I know. But it doesn't mean that I won't produce it, which means I can also do it myself still, self-publish. Put some armor set on the forearm. More just like padding of fur underneath. Joe's asking, hey, uh, do you happen to know what day my class at the art store might be? I'm going to try to plan it to be on a weekend, either a Saturday or Sunday. Because in November, at the end of this year, when I have my next session, I'm, I'm offering only uh, limited engagement classes. Even my online classes will only go for about five weeks. And those will be during the weekdays. So I'm going to try to open up that Saturday to be an in-person thing. It'll be a weekend. And again, like I said, that'll be a, a boot camp, which I want it to be about five weeks long. So it's still dynamic sketching, but in person, uh, using uh, materials in-house, actual visible things, and also possibly doing one or two trips to locations. In terms of where I'm thinking, most likely uh, I'm thinking of possibly LA Zoo, and then possibly a museum around. 
thinking of the Middletown Museum. Yeah, the digital stuff, you know, is, is a great way to quickly communicate, make fast changes in the industry. I use it a lot, but I also prefer traditional. Okay, forearm is here. Let's have more of the material hanging out. Things like beads or some kind of like accessories that this orc has picked up and carried. Kill others and grab their stuff off of them. I always like that kind of concept of when you have a character like this a warrior or soldier that goes around you know pillaging and stuff like that uh things that they would pick off the ground pick off of enemies and they would wear it kind of like you know uh accessorize in a ways and imagine like things he will be wearing uh things that they would find appealing or attractive or valued or whatever the case is being a horrific mutated <laughs> humanoid uh maybe it would be like you know Organic parts. He's got like a necklace full of ears, <laughs> something like this. Okay, so his arm's gonna come down, hand's gonna be over here. I want him to grip a dagger, some kind of weapon. Up this direction. Some kind of treacherous blade. I'll bring the sketchbook up a little bit. Let me just zoom out a little bit here so we can kind of see more of the image. I missed a couple of questions. Let me just scroll up a little bit. Uh, Dr. Tunes is mentioning, uh, you know, obviously answering a question, no problem. It's all good. This is what I'm here for, but this is also what you're adding, which is, you know, could you imagine back in the 80s or 90s, you know, the ability to speak with your favorite artist on a device in your pocket, you know, has kind of truly made me realize. I mean, of course, you know, I agree with that because, um, you know, right now in this day, current day and age, to be an artist who is also young, this is, this is no better moment to be able to explore those interests. Not only because of you know, um, the, the amount of resource information online, but the ability to you know, have this kind of connection and being able to speak to just artists through live meet, uh, streams, uh, to also expose your work out there to a larger group of people. You might think, well, I don't have like thousands of followers. You know? It doesn't matter, I'm talking like, even if your Instagram had like 100 people, 50 people, that's 50 to 100 people more that seen your work than ever before, you know? Because uh, before that, if you're like in high school or in college and you're trying to get your work out there, unless you use some type of like gallery or some agent that can get your work out there to be exposed to the individuals and, and kind of, you know, get your work attention, there's no way people would see your work at all, you know? So definitely now is the time as artists to really take advantage of these things. Um, so I know there's these complaints of like, but I don't get enough followers. I don't get this and re you know reception and likes and that kind of stuff. But it's like, you just look at it from a different perspective, you know, compared to maybe what it was maybe 20 plus years ago. None of that stuff would be ever complaints. <laughs> now, of course, you know, I'm not saying that stuff doesn't affect artists that are online. Yeah, it does matter to have your work stand out and get the attention you need and to build a a reputation and also get the opportunities and, and possibilities and stuff but you know like anything else in life it's a combination of your intensity hard work but also make sure you so and then maybe a little bit of luck and timing that somebody does see it in the right moment in time that you get that conversation going you know Play it up again
uh, probably a couple more questions I can answer here. Um, Dreams is asking, will the dynamic Bible be available in the ebook PDF version? No, I don't do ebooks. I don't do digital books. I print only. And if you do find digital books and stuff out there, it's not through me. Somebody's probably pirated. Somebody's probably repped it and then put it online, uh, which is something that actually happened with the original dynamic Bible. It was on Amazon for a little bit, actually even this year, and I took it down uh, from those people that put it up. But I don't do digital books, um, mainly because of that fact. I, no matter what, even if I do print the book out, again, like I said, it's, somebody's going to rip it off. Uh, make a knockoff version of it, make a digital version too. They'll scan the pages and that kind of thing. In China, it's a big thing that happens a lot of times in printing because, you know, the government does control what you're, what's allowed into the, the country. So books are kind of hard to get in there. But in any case, for myself, I don't really do a lot of digital books per se. And I also appreciate more printed books in general. Um, and I, I really explore that side of things. <clears throat> well, I mean, in terms of the uh, Discord that I offer, that's only for people that are signed up for the classes for the moment. Uh, I'm not offering the one-hour session just yet because I'm still wrapping up a few with people. Once those one-hour sessions are uh, finished up, uh, those will go, I, again, I'll open up more opportunities. Uh, the best times to look of when to see I offer those one-hour sessions are going to be on Mondays. So that's when I would usually potentially put up a position opening. So I'm still having to talk to maybe one or two more people right now because I'm waiting for them to kind of get back to me. Um, so hopefully soon. There are other Discord communities out there that I would say I would recommend be a part of. Uh, even the one for Lightbox is actually not a bad one to consider because of the fact that it's so active. Um, that one's going to be a good one. It's also open to the public. A lot of other ones that are out there are more specifically, you know, kind of tuned to the individual schools and, and groups and whatnot. But the Lightbox one does have a large grouping and it's, uh, again, it has the same kind of things of hangout sessions and sketching groups and that kind of stuff, uh, conversations and whatnot. So I would even join that. So Jamming Jan is asking, uh, are my, am I using references right now? No, I'm not. Sketching an orc straight into it. Orc-like creature. For those that always consider and ponder, the pen that I'm using right now is the Tombow pen made by Tombow. Uh, it's a Fure Nosuke. It's a brush pen that's felt tip. This is a soft tip right here, and I have a hard tip, which is a thinner line. Uh, these you can get at any art store, pack it. Piece by piece, section by section, we're just kind of hitting this area up. I am going to draw the full body of the character, by the way. So the sketchbook, if I zoom out a little bit more, I have about that much more space. So from this section, as I'm turning the cross contour this way, uh, the body will continue moving down the direction, and his legs will go down over here, forward. I might have him sit on something lightly, maybe on like a stump or something like that. And there's going to be an animal creature next to him on this end. We're going to have his other arm on his head. So the legs will come out maybe like that, possibly. Having to sit on something be kind of nice. Standing there is okay too, but maybe that would be better for like a down angle. Back in. Uh, super function. The question was was already asked before, but yes, general uh, simply there is there will be. Uh, detailed information will come more soon, but in this video, um, I've also talked about that. So if you go and watch it again later on, um, uh, that question does get answered. And I'm sure to be asked again, and it's okay to ask, but simply the answer is yes. There are plans for the second one by next year. <clears throat> Kriya G is a, uh, I'm assuming someone who is on Twitch that has a great art discord is what Joe is saying. So yeah, thank you for, uh, for the recommendation. Share other kind of discords that are out there, people that are looking for communities of, of individuals to work with. Uh, talking with each other here in the chat window right now is, is probably going to be a, one of the better resources too because uh, i know that as much as you would like to be able to get information from me directly uh being able to find peers and individuals that can work with on a daily kind of weekly kind of basis as well learning together sharing with each other is going to be one of your other best possibilities i've put 
So um, right now, right here, it's sharing like, hey, you know, anybody have any discords you can guys? What parts are you, you know, uh, into as well? And share that and you guys can join together. Getting reviews or thoughts and opinions on also how the experiences are. Is it active? Is it dead? You know, how are the people in terms of feedback, criticism? Are there, you know, qualities of stuff? I'd, I'd be asking all those kind of questions. piece of fabric material here belts straps side satchels and little pouches of things that they're going to be carrying why an orc would have satchels i have no idea scrap pieces of material uh, do I recommend the Stonehouse Anatomy book? Well, Dream, unfortunately, I can't give you a strong opinion because I've never actually looked at it. <laughs> I don't have a copy myself. Uh, I've heard good things from people that have owned it. Um, I haven't had a chance to really sit down and look through it, though. So I can't necessarily tell you if I would recommend it or not. Um, but what I could say is that if you maybe ask some people here, they can give you some opinion. Um, but you know, I wish I could tell you something based on what I thought, but I don't want to just say something based on something I don't know about. For me, all I can say is, is um, you know, take a risk. Maybe, maybe get it and take a look at it. I know it's spendy, uh, but you might be able to find some resources of people online talking about it in reviews. And maybe somebody here has opinions. Stonehouse book. Do I have any ever? Do I have any thoughts of moving out of California? Do you feel pretty solid where I'm at? Uh, yeah, Nike Tunes. I think where I'm at currently right now in uh, LA, Pasadena, uh, I enjoy. I've been in California now since I moved down here when I was going to school in Art Center. Uh, I've moved up and down the West Coast. I was in LA for Art Center, or Pasadena, then I went down to San Diego for seven years. I came back up here in 2016. And so I've been here since then. Um, do I have any intentions of leaving? No, because I think the community of art and design is still relatively strong here. Even though California itself goes, you know, every state in the US is going through whatever. Um, is it expensive? Yeah, but again, it's like from what I can do work wise, I can manage, you know. Um, and you know, like I said, it's it's one of those situations where a lot of the students, a lot of the schools, a lot of the places are still involved in this location. Many of the studios are here as well too. A lot of the work I do, it doesn't need to be in person or, or anymore. Again, most of the work I do right now is mostly remote. All the classes that I offer, so I don't need to be in California, but I like the you know location. I like the place. Have I considered moving out to other places? I have, you know, not seriously, but I've considered it. You know, being up in Montana and Wyoming, I think, I think those states are beautiful. I'm from Oregon, so, but I don't want to go back to Oregon. East Coast, probably not. I'd probably stay more on the west side. Honestly, even things like international, I've considered. Uh, there was a school in Paris that asked me if like, I was if I would stay there for a longer period of time, <laughs> like months to maybe years. Uh, being a local instructor as part of the school, I did a lot of workshops for them for the last number of years in Paris. And I like Paris a lot, actually. And I, I'm not much of a huge kind of city type of person, but um, I like visiting it. But I don't know if I would want to stay there for like... I like having the ability to get outdoors a little bit, you know? I don't do like tons of hikes and stuff like that, uh, but I like having a bit of space. There are all the belts and the accessories. Pushing line weight on the weapon. Stands out a little bit in opposite to behind on the body. Let's see, I'm going to go down to the lower legs. I want to kind of wrap that portion up and get a really good sense about his stance and situate him in space. Uh, Jitter is saying, uh, based on the artwork in it alone, uh, you're talking about Stonehouse. Okay, for Stonehouse's work. 
So you have it based on the artwork in it alone, in your opinion, makes it great. Awesome. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah, Arturius. Those are all shoes behind me. Boxes and boxes of shoes. A lot of this stuff is going to go back out. Uh, some of them I keep. Some of them, you know, I, I put in storage. Other times I gift them. Other times I'm putting artwork on them. Other times I sell them because I'm trying to get rid of stock. I'm not reselling them. A lot of times I sell them for retail. Uh, but because I have collections of them, uh, some of them I don't hold on to anymore. I just sell them. But those are unorganized right now. <laughs> I was a little bit concerned, like, oh man, are people going to see the mess of my room right now because of the webcam? And it's a bit of a mess, but it goes through fluctuations. I'm sure all of you experience that with uh, being an artist and having your own room. There are times when you clean it, and all of a sudden, you know, after a day, it goes messy again. Clutter is really what it is. I just have so much stuff. Okay, so I'm trying to visualize the way his leg is going to come down. Let me pull back the camera a little bit here. So you can just kind of see this being planned out. Okay, so I want to make his right leg straight coming down. This is where he's going to be putting a lot of his weight on. His left leg is going to be coming out a little bit. Like this. Of course, the front maybe bent a little bit. Here, and his other arm is going to come down where you see the forearm coming up, and the animal is going to be off to the side. So I want the right leg to be established to be straight, to be bent on the le on the um, left leg. Let's see if we can get that. Excuse me, as I maybe not answer the question for a second, I need to um, take. Uh, is this possibly to mess up? Yes. Do I mess up all the time? <laughs> I can mess up all the time. Does it require like super concentration? Eh, well, kind of a little bit. You know, I can speak and talk and do that kind of stuff while I'm doing this at the same time. But at the same time, you know, I just want to make sure I'm aware of where things are going, how it's going to be established on. Fabric materials hanging off this end. Because it's again going down angle, I'm gonna continue turning these cross contours upwards. I wanna push the scale down, scale it in the size of the appendages. Rather here. We'll indicate some small stuff, not a lot of crazy detail just yet. Down into his foot. Armor of the boots. About like clawed portions. Maybe his toes will be exposed. So the perspective of it established down here with a plane. Other leg bent. Getting some material hanging off of it, and then some of the armor behind. Maybe just a portion of his foot sticking out. Show evidence of it. We don't need to fully finish it just yet. I just need to establish a few indicators. These are my landmarking points. This is the way I construct very lightly, uh, where you won't be able to really see it, but it's enough construction for me to understand where things go. It's straight in. A lot of it is very much you know straight into the details of things I need to do. But it's also my way of constructing now into a method that incorporates it being a clear image that goes into the illustration. But it's not like fundamental in terms of the way educationally we learn how to construct. It uses portions of it. But it does require a lot of practice to be able to integrate it lightly. Have some materials of clothing hanging off in the back. Flowing into the wind. Other arm's gonna come down, you can't see it. Shoulders over here, forearm coming out. Here we'll place his hand. Now let's have to zoom in a little bit more. <clears throat> Let's 
Moody's asking, am I taking on new students for the one-on-one -on -one mentorships? Uh, I'll have to take a look for your email, Anon. I apologize. It might have gone into my spam. So I don't check my spam every single week. So I'll double check and make sure I can find it. If I don't respond in the next day or two, re-email me, please. Okay. Uh, right now, the mentorship is filled. I'm actually working with somebody right now because the session is in, in running. So my next sessions don't begin until November of this year. So in that round, I will be taking on one more mentorship student in November, which will go on for eight weeks. So email me when you can if, if, if I don't respond to you back. But thanks for asking, Ahmad, and I apologize for not getting back to you. I just didn't see the email. Got another question over here. Just curious, what does Superani mean? Uh, I see I'm a part of this organization, as you labeled it, along with Kim Jong-gi. I wouldn't really call it an organization. It's more of a... Um, collective right it's a collective of artists who have a lot of mutual interests and um also a friendship they just people we just all know each other so the meaning of superani there is something of a meaning there the manager of superani is a guy uh, named hyunjin kim the guy with the long white hair with the beard he's the one that came up with the name i don't remember the name what, uh, what it actually means though uh, i can barely remember but what i can say is that superani essentially is a collective of artists that first started in korea uh, with Kim Jong-gi, with Hyunjin Kim, they were mostly their students. So they started collecting students together as being a part of their group. And so, you know, they were then making books and had the school out there in Korea. And then over the many years, in the 2015s and 10s, or 10-15s, uh, they started, you know, bringing in some other artists internationally, starting with people like in Europe, and like in parts of Asia. Uh, in the U.S., there's only maybe a couple of superani artists, me being one of them, Aliza Ivanova being the other. Um, I don't know of any other Superani artists. There are a few from what I can remember, but I don't exactly know them. <laughs> so I don't know everybody that's a part of it. And uh, it doesn't mean officially anything, really. It's like, there's no contract. You don't get paid for anything. Uh, the only way you get paid is if you collaborate with them to make a book. They're mostly known as a publisher of printing books, essentially. So, um, so they find artists that they are finding mutual or common kind of directions towards. And they, they collaborate and work with those artists to help publish books for them. So, So how did I become a part of the group? Again, because I just know, know them, mutual friends. Over the years, we got to know each other more and more, uh, getting together at Comic-Con shows. And you know, the manager uh, here in the US is an old friend of mine from college days. So um, it's just, there is a history of people that we know each other from. And a lot of the artists that are part of the groups are people that I also know as well. So like I said, it's, it's kind of a, um, a grouping of friends, essentially. Carl, yeah, he's one of them. I've known Carl for a while. Sorry, I missed a couple of questions here. Um, question here from Ahmed. Uh, trying to get more advanced with organic form, especially complex ones I copy other than dynamic sketching works, but I try to get something more imagination. Um, I'm t so I think the question of what you're trying to ask is you are trying to obviously explore organic abstracted forms, shape the forms using cross contours. And so you're using the dynamic sketching book to help give you examples of what the exercise is. Uh, but I'm assuming you're saying it's hard for you to come up with something from the imagination that is maybe somewhat uh, unique in its different application within that. I understand how difficult that can be to come up with that kind of stuff. This is where I think, again, like I said, finding mutual artists and people that you can work with to get different perspectives on it will be the most helpful. Um, to be able to see more video content, to not only have the book, but then also seeing demos and examples and, and people talking about it. Because, you know, dynamic sketching now is being taught by many other people. A lot of them are former students of mine who are instructors now. Uh, so there are opportunities to get this kind of information through things like, even now, you know, everybody goes to the whole Dropbox thing. Go to it, you know? So, you know, they had the whole uh, Reddit thing where you can see probably community forums and stuff and people see you know, how they can produce those stuff. So having others like-mindedness and approach towards what they're doing is probably what you need right now. If you just do it by yourself, again, you only have just one perspective of it. 
Uh, Ewok, this is a kind of a combination of a custom and retail. So this sketchbook that I'm using right now, people want to see it real quickly, uh, is a leather bound book. It's a case bound. And it uses this really kind of like nice uh, creamish handmade paper from Italy. So it's a company called Epica, E-P-I-C-A, Epica. Uh, and it's not cheap. So this book was expensive. And I only just started it maybe a couple of, maybe a month or two ago. I've only just cracked into the book itself. I only got about that much done. So this one I'm putting in, you know, obviously the larger pieces. <clears throat> Scroll down a little bit. Uh, Victor Kavachev is based in Paris. He's in Europe. Carl's in the UK. Uh, do I have any favorite paper brands? Weight presses. I like cold press paper, Ewok. Uh, I also like just, honestly, just Canson. The Canson cold press watercolor paper is my main paper that I use for a lot of commissions and stuff and artwork that I produce. You know, the whole arches, watercolor paper is great. It's fantastic quality. It's expensive. And maybe if I was doing things like really large illustrations uh, for like gallery shows and that kind of stuff, I would use that kind of paper. But for like my everyday kind of use or, or you know, it was small illustration work, Canson watercolor paper is what I go for. Yeah, uh, extremely salty boy. Uh, Charles, who is an instructor that I know uh, well because I've taken a class with him many, many years ago in 2009. Uh, he taught a figure drawing class. He teaches dynamic sketching because uh, he took over for my position over at Art Center. So when I left Art Center, he continued teaching dynamic sketching, but he never took it originally with Norm, my mentor, who taught the class originally. Uh, so Charles, I actually gave him my notes. I told him, this is what I cover, this is what I do. So he carried it on and continued with his own version. But he comes from a more organic and illustrative style of figure work. So his dynamic sketching method is very different than what I do, uh, but it still uses the same fundamentals of the idea of sketching, you know, effectively, confidently. Uh, so he does use a lot of the methods I, I showed him uh, when he first started. So he took that information and went over the New Masters Academy, which again, I don't care. These artists learn these things and they share with other people to help them benefit them. Great. As long as they recognize where the origins are coming from, which some of them will, some of them won't acknowledge as much. But for me, I always acknowledge that the lessons of plans that I learned from are coming from my mentor, Norm. Uh, so I'm not the originator for this, and nor is he. The idea of dynamic sketching is a curation of information of different disciplines of creative fields on a technique of how to sketch. So he pulled from architecture, transportation, product design, illustration, and created this collective of ideas of, of methods of techniques on sketching that he called dynamic sketching at Art Center. So when I took it with him, which he'd been teaching it for like 10 years or more, uh, I TA'd with him, taught with him, and then you know I took over for him at Art Center when he passed away in 2010. I've been teaching this method now from, from his shoes on uh, for over 12 years. So Art Center, I left in 2020 when shutdown had happened. I didn't go back. Uh, so when I did leave, that's when then Charles kind of took over you know, base. So but yeah, Charles was not a student of Norm's. Uh, let's see. Canson generally makes a bunch of really great papers. Yeah, I like the papers overall. Uh, what is the name of the brush pen I'm using right now? This is a Tombow brush pen. This entire sketch I use is one pen. Tombow. A food aid pen. Uh, what name of brush pen? Did, oh, sorry, I already answered that question. Um, so Fafi is saying, I have a really nice sketchbook. You're scared to draw in it because I'm very sloppy and don't want to ruin the nice paper. Here's the thing. Uh, if you don't start, you'll never use it. Because do you actually think you'll completely overcome that feeling that you, you think that your work is too, um, that's not clean, basically. You're probably going to, always going to feel somewhat of a concern in your quality of your work because we as artists are always going to think that way. And so, but it's your perception of it. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means that's how you feel. Uh, but you have to overcome it by acting. And so that good quality of sketchbook if you treat it as this, as this you know, um, mentality of something that you can't touch because you don't want to mess it up, you'll never touch it. And it'll sit there, and that's all you ever think about, you know, about why, I, I, why you don't want to approach it because you're not being good enough for it. Uh, the best thing to do is start by saying, but I don't want to mess it up. But the thing is, well, that's how you learn. And you can just get another one in the future. You know? uh, at the end of the day, what it is is also just a book with paper. So yeah, it can be expensive in some cases, and you want to treat it with good quality because you care. You care that much. But at the same time, you're not going to make forward progress if you don't crack it open and do something with it. Uh, 
uh, Salty Boy saying there was a lot of overlap when I took the class with him at New Masters Academy, uh, what he taught and stuff in my dynamic Bible. Well, that's because, again, those notes I gave him <laughs> uh, years ago. Um, Depends on your finger. Do you think that what uh, when learning the technique taught uh, in Nicolaides, I don't know that one, it is essential to balance it out with more structural art style simultaneously like Bridgman? So if you're talking something more that's more uh, gestural, you know, illustrative in a way, organic, uh, yeah, mixing those two things together are really important because you have to learn how to structure things to be able to also break the rules on stuff. If you're overly kind of gestural and, and more based on movement of line, sometimes without structure, you can't perceive sense of form, right? space as well too. So you need a combination of both. It's not one or the other or one after the other. It's combined both simultaneously, if anything else. So taking one class, another one in combination together in the, in the dual sense actually can help. Yeah, you can go one or the after the other too. In that situation, it doesn't really matter where you begin. The fact is, you just have to start. Don't be afraid of the materials. Once you put in that sense of uh, hesitation and burden and pressure from that material, it'll stay with that thing. That's all you'll feel from it. Now that we have the entirety of the, the orc in here, I'm going to draw the, the creature over here on this side, but before I do so, let's finish him off a little bit more. Let me go back into the hand, and let's just zoom in back into the section again. We've been going at about for about an hour and 12 minutes, so I'm going to try to finish as much as possible. Uh, like I said, this was a session for maybe about an hour and a half. Uh, I might only really end up staying for about another 30 minutes or so. It's about almost 9 o'clock right now, so I might have to step out. Uh, things of evening, dinner time might need to happen. Do a little bit of cleaning of my place, not only just my room, but also some other stuff around the house. Other things I gotta take care of. We'll do as much as we can in the last maybe 20, 30 minutes or so. In that time, if anybody has any last questions or comments, uh, use this time in the way you would like. But I do hope you guys have been enjoying the current session. Uh, like I said, I would like to be a bit more mindful of trying to do more streams. I kind of got out of the phase of it because uh, it just got really crazy hectic with uh, the recent shows and expos. And so I've been concentrating so much on teaching and also on the projects in hand that I haven't had a chance to really do streams as much. Um, and I always kind of forget like how much reception I get on YouTube, honestly. My, my Instagram is where my main channel is. But I always forget that I actually have a pretty decent amount of people on YouTube that I can actually put videos on, but I have to make content for it. Um, and for me, the YouTube is just another way to just reach more people. You know, so I'm not trying to use it as a form of some type of like, you know, monetary gain or something like this. So it's just a way to kind of keep the content organized in some manner. And also, you know, uh, specific to people that have access to it, of course, too. So then, you know, Twitch, I do have the subscription thing, but. The Gumroad videos I like to do more. Next week I'm gonna release another one. Gumroad video. My second one is out. I've only done two, I only just started it. I'd like to do the third one by next week. That one I wanna to try to do one based off of a ballpoint pen drawing. Appreciate that. Thank you. Go back into this weapon over here, kind of texture, maybe an end piece here that has accent. Metal attachment. And I do hope that some of you have been sketching a little bit. And if you have, post it, you know, uh, share it. Some kind of creature, orc, that kind of thing. A little further down now. I didn't officially start this from the very beginning at the start of the stream. I already had kind of the face in there, just about that, about that much done. But the rest of it we've done now live here. 
And like I said, in about a week, I'll post this back up on YouTube so that people can watch it. Open. In the moment, it'll be only left to the reserve of. By the way, always do keep in mind that, you know, anything we discuss here is always based on just, you know, my opinion, my advice. It's not necessarily an answer, uh, nor truth or bias of things that you have to kind of go towards. Um, just use it as information or guidance of any way you want to uh, take it or leave it, you know, so it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a place to be able to at least chat, share, uh, be creative and work on things on your own as well, too, is why I do this. Uh, only one K. If you drew the same thing I drew, is it fine to post it? Yeah, fine with me. It's your take and interpretation on something you're seeing, so why not? Just, you know, talk about it. What did you see? Why, why did you draw it? What did you sketch it for? Uh, when you give context on, on social media postings, it gives you, it gives people a reason to understand what it is you're trying to share. And maybe even more of a reason to follow you. We're done up that back section. Let's go down to the legs a little bit here. More scars and torn up portions. Leg. Some shadow shapes in between some spacing. Uh, let's see, I took a question from Blaze Chambers. So you live in Montana and you like to sketch when you're out hiking. Thing is, out in the forest, there's pretty much just evergreen trees all around. Having a hard time breaking them down. They seem to be just a uniform mass of noise, unlike a, a deciduous tree, uh, with distinct masses. Any tips on how to approach these? Well, you know, within a, a hike through a forest, it's hard to singularize the silhouette of that thing. You need distance. Distance is key when it comes to that. Because the further you are away, which I'm sure you're aware of this, that you can then see the silhouette of the actual object itself. So that would be one way to do it. But being able to actually find a clearing which you can maybe isolate a few of them would be also best. Uh, in that situation, there's also interpretation. Not going to those singular individual pieces of specific details, but the interpreting of the bigger shapes and silhouettes. Start 2D, then work into 3D by building the form of volume by capturing a light and shadow area. The best thing to do is squint, squint your eyes a little bit, and collect the darks and the lights together. Uh, if you want to, what you can also do is take a photograph of the thing. If you got Photoshop, take it home to Photoshop. Use this option called Image Adjustment and Threshold. By using Threshold, you can adjust the tab to make it a black and white uh, image from your photograph. And you'll see the distinct grouping of dark and lights. So you can use it as a way to group your shadow shapes and lights. The silhouette is going to be really important. And even though they might be very leafy, there'll be some form of silhouette you can maybe interpret from that. But those are some of the recommendations I would give in that situation. Uh, but when you're hiking on location, instead of drawing that giant thing to kind of break up the routine, also look at some of the small stuff. You know, textural surfaces, individual leaves, um, you know, branch structures, uh, funguses, maybe rock forms, that kind of stuff, right? So I hope that helps a little bit, Blaze. Uh, Moody is asking, are the next Dynamite Sketching classes also starting in November? Yes, they are, will be. Uh, is there a place on the website to sign up? If you go to peterhanstyleart.com, my website, uh, you'll find information about the classes then when they are registering. So I'll always announce on my Instagram when that happens. Just keep an eye on the Instagram. It's going to happen in November. It's only going to be a five-week boot camp situation, but they're going to be a bit lower in cost for more open access to individuals. Next year, I'll come back with full classes again. Let's see. Olas is asking, you're from Lisbon. Have I ever been to Portugal? Uh, I have not. I was invited to come out this year to go check out uh, what recently just happened, which was uh, the Trojan Horse Unicorn event. And that just, I think, wrapped and finished. 
and it looked great. It looked like a lot of fun. Uh, I was asked to come out because Kim Jong Gi and Super Ronnie crew were out there, so they asked me if I wanted to come out with them. But unfortunately, my schedule didn't work out. I just had too much things going on right now, and it was a bit too immediate and last minute. But uh, there is the extended invitation for next year. So Portugal next year, Malta. I might be out to that show THU next year. But that's going to be a year from now, so a little bit of time to wait. And who knows what will happen? You know, there could be potentials of things where um, other events might be happening as well too. Uh, I'd like to be coming out internationally more next year around. I need to hit up a bunch of places. I've been re-invited to uh, the event in Poland, the Promise Land event. Uh, that happened this year as well too. They invited me out for that one as well, but I had to cancel it because of the timing. It was last minute. Uh, so next year, I'm also. I said I would be available for them for that one. Um, Portugal event, I'll try to go to for THU. I'd like to go to two workshops internationally, one in Paris, if I can contact the school again, maybe one in Austria uh, for the school that also worked out before back then too. We'll see if it happens. No guarantees, but my intention is to try to do a lot more international stuff by next, next year. Don't want to overwork the bottom half of the legs. It can be easily, you know, uh, mismanageable in terms of like where information goes. Don't want to overdo it. I want to keep and retain a lot of the information to the top as it sees down to the bottom. I want to keep this a bit more open. I want that concentration of contrast and focal point to the top of the head. So there will be details. It's just that it's more of indicative light suggestion open-ended shapes, not a lot of fill of darks. A few pieces here and there. This back leg, which is bent, is going to be in shadow region, so I'm going to just kind of group it together flatly with a simple hatching. We'll push line weight. One thing I do want to incorporate as it transitions down, thick to thin weight. Do a couple of spots of darks to kind of show overlaps this armor piece down to the bottom towards the foot. And we'll see if I come back and tend to this a bit more later on after the stream is done within the lower half, if need be. So just the other foot, and that will go down in shadow shape. Together. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Let's take a look at how this looks. So let's put the animal, his, um, I wanted to make it some kind of like a wolf-like creature kind of thing over here. Of, of course, within the world of Tolkien, there are the, the wargs and stuff like that, but I don't want to make that. I just want to make my own version. Make it up. A large head, tiny ears, give it kind of a hog pig like feel as well too with the tusks and whatnot give it more of a nose of canine Let's zoom in a little bit closer all right to mess up Notes down, what you like about it, what you don't like about it, try it again. Full part of what happens. I 
I kind of want to mimic his face a little bit into this one. That forward set chin, I want that in here a little bit. Then he's going to be spittling and drooling a little bit. I'll have his. Here, we'll do the right paw leg. This will all be shadow shaped back here. Back down a little bit. kind of long tail. And he's sitting, so his other foot, back foot, is going to be coming forward. There's a creature sitting there now. Uh, do I have an LLC? Uh, right now, I don't. I am considering starting up an S, S Corp soon uh, for my school. But when would you want to consider making it? I mean, if you're running a business, right? you actually make a product, you offer some sort of service. At that point, I consider it. But before then, it's like, not really. For me, uh, making one is mostly just for tax stuff, you know. Other than that, there's no reason. As an independent, you know, uh, business and, and artist, yeah, at some point considering it would be wise, especially if you do certain numbers. You make a certain amount per year, then, you know, I would consider it. Zoom in a little bit closer to this animal. Well, Tirada is actually one of my main inspirations for a lot of things. When I was in uh, college years, I used to look at his stuff constantly. It was a big inspiration of mine. And uh, from Tirada, it led into, you know, obviously people like Mobius and whatnot, because Mobius is the main inspiration for Tirada. Uh, and for a lot of other artists, out there, I would say. For me as well, too, uh, Mobius is a huge inspiration on top of the countless many others that are out there. You can't necessarily base your, you know, inspiration of career off of a single artist, of course, you know. And there are some people that do that. And you end up getting someone that, you know, becomes a carbon copy of that person, which you don't. I mean, you can be successful in some ways doing that. But um, for me, it wasn't the case. Mobius is, you know, obviously quite prolific in what he did and in terms of this ability to quick sketch and also draw with this same confidence. I, I think Mobius had this, you know, otherworldly aspect about him, I think. It would have been cool to meet him before his passing. He did visit things like Comic Cons remotely, well, once in a while. I have friends that have met him in the past, but. It would be nice to have met him.
one person I saw in person that uh, I wish I got to actually even interact with more was Ray Harryhausen, another prolific, amazing filmmaker, concept artist, illustrator. I consider Harryhausen actually to be honestly one of the more first official concept artist kind of types. We consider Sid Mead as being one of those. There's another artist I really give a lot more props to, which is um, Von Cobb. And also guys like, you know, Phil Tippett who are just amazing animators. But Ray Harryhausen was like... And I grew up with his films as a kid, you know, from Sinbad to Jason the Argonauts, Clash of the Titans. I used to watch those constantly. And you can consider that Ray's, you know, work, even though he kind of touched everything from the animation to the filmmaking to design and the creatures and all that kind of stuff, he would do these illustrations that are production shots from the films. And they were beautiful illustrations. But not a lot of, I would say, uh, the younger audience in, in the educational field today would probably have seen a lot of Ray's work, unfortunately. Um, I don't think he's as widely celebrated within our field. Within our industry, people know him, obviously. We consider him as being such an amazing uh, artist and filmmaker. But within this crowd moving forward, I just don't think he's looked at with that same level of reverence. But also maybe even like inspiration compared to some of the older guys, you know, that have been in the industry from the 80s and 70s and 80s and 90s. Because they grew up with him a lot. For me and my generation, it would have been guys like, you know, of course, Sid Mead and whatnot. So many inspirations out there, so many artists to look at. And, you know, the more you uh, expose yourself to those individual people, the more rounded you'll start to become. You can't be biased based on certain things you like or don't like. It's just more of what can you learn from them, right? Just because they use a certain type of method or technique or material or industry focus, uh, you should never, you know, cut things of inspiration of, I guess, uh, visual inspiration out. Probably, you know, people that, you know, work in uh, stop motion animation and people thought that was, was going to die, you know, in the 90s because of Jurassic Park and CGI kind of stuff, but it survived. Uh, I was watching a stop motion animation last night from Leica. I still enjoy those kind of films a lot. Bill Tippett just released, you know, his, one of his films, uh, what was it, Mad God or something like that? I've yet to see it. I've been wanting to. Waiting for it to come out where I can buy it, actually. Just using some of these darks to help separate from figure a little bit here. Button. Well, it's about an hour and 35 now. So let's do our last 10 minutes uh, and again thank you for those that have joined in appreciate it i will be try to back uh be back on next this coming week actually um i'd like to be able to do another session as i had previously had mentioned on tuesday i will be back around that time in terms of when no plans yet it'll be a pop-up so it'll happen when it happens
I'm going to wrap up a couple of things on this image. I mentioned the idea of maybe doing some uh, marker stuff on this, but I don't know. Maybe I'll do a recording of this separately. Uh, don't know if I'm going to still use marker on this or not. Would be nice. More for just you know, local color placement. A lot of rendering with the marker. That's just the perspective plane a little bit here, just to give you an idea how they're sitting and standing. Zoom out a bit more now, Let's get the entire image. Line weight a bit heavier around these areas. Anyways, um, next time I think we'll try to do another case in this particular sketchbook. Uh, what I'll be drawing, I have no plans for it. We'll just draw what we draw. Um, but look for this one to be posted up on social media soon. Sex and stuff lying around. Bats and little flies. You don't follow hopefully you can and if you want to find out more information uh, the website is also linked on there as well for future classes if you guys are interested check it out now i'll see you guys all next tuesday for those of you that join uh, if it doesn't happen to happen for some sort of emergency i do apologize uh, but i would like to shoot for sometime next week plan it for tuesday but if it doesn't maybe sometime around then words it and i'll see you then guys appreciate it thanks